Okay, back to business. Thanks for coming back. Thanks for not falling asleep. <laughs> because, because now, when I was invited to by town to give you these talks, I was especially asked that I present you how we constructed the database of Mexican birds, how we are using it for developing a, a different set of analysis that involve diversity, endemism, and conservation, and biogeographic relationships among the, the taxa. And, and I want you, uh, again, sorry because Mexico is so far from here and nobody cares about it, but think that is that the steps we have been following to construct this database and to analyze all the data that we have to give answers to different scientific and conservation questions is really important. Imagine that you have to do this for your own countries, that you have to do this from the scratch in some, in some instances and in other instances from databases that are already outside. I think it is a very good example because this database, this data set, has been used more than any other in the world to, to develop many things on, on biodiversity studies. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you about different things. I, I want to tell you a little history because tropical countries share same patterns in the history of explorations. Tropical countries, we, we share also same patterns of the impact of the foreign researchers into the knowledge of our natural resources and our, our biodiversity. Tropical regions share that we are, are the, the species-rich areas, but we are not the data-rich regions. Because, why? Because all the data are, in general, housed outside. That is why I want to give you uh, an overview of what we have done and what could be done by each of you in your own countries to understand this development and this, this process of amazing a data set that could be use, useful for many, for many things. I'm going to speak about three main areas before getting to the analysis of data. I'm going to speak about the people. I'm going to speak about the, pu the pu published information. And I'm going to speak about the collections and how we constructed the database. I'm going to show you the database. I'm going to show you how to, uh, I'm trying to teach you how to construct these authority files. What, what do we do? How we process some of the data? And then how, how once we have the clean data set, what can we do with, with that? So ornithology, again, is our, our main framework. We, we want to understand how this is a result of a series of unfortunate or fortunate events in the history. In the tropics, we have this very interesting thing. The knowledge of biodiversity goes deep inside the time, especially in regions like here in Africa or in Latin America, where people has been pop populated the, the areas for so long. Mesoamerica is a region that, the cultural region that we live in, Mexico is located, has a long tradition in knowledge of natural resources. In, in fact, the knowledge of the, of the biodiversity, the, the, the serious knowledge of the biodiversity goes back to the presence of the Indian people in several parts of Mexico, where, where they have perfect knowledge of the species that were present in the areas, they have perfect knowledge of the uses of the species in the area, and they have as uh, complicated taxonomic systems, folk taxonomic systems, that were useful for them and al allowed the, them to, to use the, the biodiversity in a right manner. That happens for thousands of years until back in 15, 
21, the Spaniards or the Spanish arrived to Mexico. We were conquered and we started to be a colony of Spain. And the Crown of Spain has a deep interest, a deep interest in knowing about the biodiversity because they want to know if they have enough natural resources to survive and to obtain money of those. However, the King of Spain in that, in that age was Philip II was re really interested in knowing about the, the biological diversity and he sent this guy to Mexico to survey the, the knowledge, the Indian knowledge of, about the natural resources. This guy was Francisco Hernandez, he was the doctor of Philip II and the Indian people in, in Mexico called him the Asker. So there was this guy that I can imagine, the, the guy with the, with the notes as following the people, say, what do you use this bird for? What do you use this plant for? So they, they call him the, the asker. And he produced a very important work on the biodiversity of the new Spain that was, the, the Mexico, that was the name of Mexico in those times. He is a huge, it was a huge volume of notes ab ab about about animals and plants that unfortunately was lost and burned with a castle in El Escorial several years before. Part of the manuscripts were recovered and then published. The, 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 he, he worked in the 16th century. 100 years later, part of the manuscripts were published. And also, this is a common pattern also. Priests and other educated people work recovering the traditional knowledge on the, on the biodiversity. However, the very first work on the biodiversity of Mexico was never published. This guy was Jose Mariano Mocinho. He was a naturalist that participated in an expedition during 1787 to 18. 03, that called the Real Expedición Española, the Royal Expedition to New Spain, that was led by Martín Cese, a botanist. It was basically a, a, a botanical exploring, but Mocinho was in his heart, was an ornithologist. He was joined by a group of painters. It was a very, very special expedition, as, as most expeditions in the world that took, took part, the, that were performed during the 16 and 17 and 18 centuries, the, the expeditions will have a naturalist with them and a painter. With, they didn't have photographs. And so Mocinho was helped by very keen painters that painted every specimen that he collected and prepared. And Mocinho produced a, a volume depicting and describing for the first time for science many of the species of the Mexican avifauna. When Mocinho was brought back to, was, was taken to Spain to work in uh, his manuscripts at the, at the end of the expedition, and he was working on that when the French arrived to, to Spain and took all the collections with them and destroyed the, collection, the Mexican collections. So he, he was hiding in the museum for for several months with no food, no water, and with a war outside until he left, and he left the, the manuscript without publishing. Later, about in the year 2002, one of our friends, Graciela Zamudio, that she is a researcher on the history of science in Mexico, discovered the manuscript, the original manuscript in, the, in a library in Spain, and we were able, Town and I, we were able to to browse into this manuscript. It depicts a lot of species of, of Mexican birds, the first descriptions, and, and there's a paper that you, you are interested, I can provide to you. Why do I speak about unfortunate events? Exploration of any part of the world, especially the biological explorations, depend on how the political issues are, are, are in the region. This, uh, in Mexico we had a, a civil war. We were part of the Crown of Spain for 300 years from until in 1810, 
we started our independence revolution that ended, uh, that, that ended in 1821. And once, once, the, once the war was over, Mexico was really a mess. We have also a saying in Mexico that says, when the, when the river is muddy, the fishermen are lucky, right? Everything is... This, this is a paper that depicts the history of one of the first, essentially the first scientific explorator in Mexico, that was William Bullock. It was a guy that was interested in mining, but also was interested in obtaining money from selling specimens to the European museums that he collected in, in, in several parts of the world, and Mexico was one of his stops. But look, this phrase, after the independence, it, it was possible for Europeans of any nationality to settle in Mexico and send home whatever they want. It, does it sound familiar to you? It's, it's a history of the exploration of the tropical countries. See, here we have the Europeans, the Americans, getting to a country that has no precise regulations on collecting, on exporting, um, et cetera, et cetera. And especially for these Europeans, it, it was a history of them. We, ha we have several kind of guys that arrived to Mexico in those days that were the main producers of the biodiversity data we are using now. We have guys like this French, Adolphe Bouca. He was a merchant, a, a merchant, a comerciante, a merchant, that lived of selling hummingbirds to the European collections and to the European fashion houses, because the ladies in that, those ages would like to have hummingbird, stuffed hummingbirds in the hats. So he, he was collecting in Mexico, in Ecuador, and, and in Brazil, and produce a newspaper. It was like a catalog of birds that you can buy from me, coming from Mexico, etc., etc. We have guys like Matteo Botteri, this, this was an Italian, that came to Mexico to do any, something else. He was a professor of French in one high school. But he was very, a very keen naturalist. He was very interested in, in, in birds and in collecting and in, in in preparing the specimens. So he produced a good deal of the specimens that were sent or sold to other museums. And here we have Francois Sumicrast, another, another French, that he was, he was married to a Mexican woman. And he went to live to a certain region of Mexico in Oaxaca. And there he was, he, as a naturalist that was taking care of the cattle and of the crops and of the corn. He was collecting the specimens, he was, he was surveying birds and produced a good set of data in, in the middle 19th century. Two of them married Mexican women. And that's a pattern that repeats from time to time for, for, for the collectors, right, Tom? That's the only way they can stay in Mexico, if you... So guys, if you're single, there are plenty of beautiful Mexican women <laughs> waiting for you. If you want to live in Mexico. Yeah? If you want to live in Mexico. Yeah, it's a nice place. <laughs> <laughs> what, what's, what's the next historical pattern? I am going fast on this, because this is general patterns. Mexican science began to be productive until the second half of the 19th century when the first society of natural history was produced and that, that's the time we have people like this, this guy, Montezoca, it doesn't matter. He was a naturalist, he was a painter also. He was able to produce data also on, on the distribution and taxonomy of hummingbirds. But by the end, of the 19th century, 
we have a second group of researchers getting to Mexico to do biological research. And this was a major survey that was performed by people from the British Museum in, in Middle America. It was a project called Biologia Centrale Americana that essentially was go to many places of Central America. Salvin and Goldman were based in London. However, both of them went to the field. Went to the, went to the different countries and hired professional collectors. They sent professional collectors and they bought a, a good amount of collections that were made in, in the countries and brought those collections back to the British Museum and then studied all the collections. They, they produced a multi-volume paper. Have you ever heard? No, nah, of course not. No, forget it. <laughs> it's a stupid question of me. But, but this is a multi-volume and multi-taxon uh, publication. It's, it's huge, it's very beautifully illustrated, and it consists, uh, is, is part of the main source of biodiversity data from our, our region. Another group of people working, and working in Mexico and producing information about the bi biodiversity of birds were the people that were working at the universities in the United States. This happened about the first half of the 20th century. All of these people were working in Mexico doing surveys, but in a different fashion. These were university people. They were using Mexico as a field trip for their students, as a field site for their PhD, for their PhD dissertations. But they produced important reference works. The other thing that is common to all tropical countries is that one day the area becomes important for bird watching. And that happens to, for Mexico in, in, in the, by the 1960s and we began the, to see the appearance of many field guides. So we have this bunch of new guys surveying the, the fauna producing data, doing, do, doing field work, and generating information that we are, are using. Back in, the, back in the 1970s, we had the first professional ornithologists working in the universities. And now please meet my colleagues, my colleagues back in Mexico. What is happening here and why, uh, what I want to, to point out here, ornithology in Mexico has been behind most of the other areas of zoology, incredibly, because since the beginning of time until the 1980s, most of the researchers doing ornithology in Mexico were foreigners. Or most of the collections found there are located outside outside Mexico. And so it's very recent that we have research groups working there. Well, just, just, just for you to understand what are the temporal patterns we will find. One, one way to look at the development of the ornithology and the biodiversity studies is by looking at the bibliography. I have been constructing this database. This is one database that is accessory to the Atlas database. Remember, I, I, I want to say the, the Atlas of Birds of Mexico database is a conjunction of information. We have an uh, ancillary databases like this one of the bibliography that now has holds more than 6,000 references relevant to the birds of Mexico and that is updated almost daily. It's one of my, I arrive to my office, check the bibliography and update the, the database. It's something very useful for, for us 